And so, church family, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Let's ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, you said that your word is going to accomplish the purpose for which you sent it, and so accomplish that purpose in our hearts. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so, dear friends, the world has indefinitely changed. Uh, We are facing changes, it seems, on the hour. When it comes to schools, uh, I know Kansas has canceled the rest of their school year, that Indiana, it seems to be. Illinois has not. I think it's April 7th right now. In Illinois, on Friday, our governor told us that we were going to be uh, ordered to stay at home. And we've been determining what that means. That means uh, basically no unnecessary group gathering. means that we can go to the grocery store and the gas station and medical clinics, but um, uh, we don't have to just gather as a crowd. And what it means is that this is probably you watching online, maybe for some of you the first time you've ever live streamed a service. Welcome again, by the way. What it means for the church is that even though we're in the middle of the season called Lent and approaching Easter, I can't tell you when we should or will worship in person again. I can't make those promises. What it means, as we've seen, is the TP crisis of 2020, where it seems not anyone has enough, or some have too many, I don't know. But in all of this, I wanted to ask you a question because of the rapid changes of our world. I wanted to ask you, where are you going to go for peace? And I think of some of the options we could go to. Uh, Right now, we could pin our hopes for peace on a cure. Um, I I heard that Dr. Fauci and President uh, Donald Trump were talking about a possible cure related to a malaria drug. And that drug, uh, let me pronounce it right, hydroxychloroquine or something like that, uh, maybe be something that, that you can take that will stop the coronavirus from entering the cells of your body. And some scientists have done small sample sizes, and, 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 and they said it has been successful in small sample sizes. And, and so I guess we could just hope that we're going to have a cure. Now, if there's any country that could do it, I, I think we could do it. The first to build a car, the first in flight, the first to go to a moon. We could be the first to cure coronavirus. Maybe that's where we could find peace. Well, we could pin our hopes for peace on leadership. That right now, uh, those in charge are making the right decisions for us not to contract COVID-19 and for there to be a lessening uh, of this disease across our country. If you haven't seen this graph, I'm sure you will in the coming weeks, the, the flattening of the curve. That maybe Illinois' in shelter process will help us to flatten the curve and not end up like China did, and not end up like Italy did, but rather end up like South Korea and Japan, taking those measures so that we are safe. So we could pin our hopes on, on our leaders and their right decisions. You know, a, a final thing we could pin our hopes upon is progress after this. I was listening to Governor J.B. Pritzker who said, you know, after the Chicago fire, that is when Chicago started building their skyscrapers, when the city took off. And it's, it's the place of the fire that they started the Chicago Fire Academy. And so maybe we could pin our hopes on all the progress going on. I know at schools, they're they're being very innovative, and businesses are being very innovative, and and even church, we're being very innovative, and and next week, we're going to have even a a better live stream for you than this phone, Um, and so maybe we can just say, well, this is all for our progress, and pin our hopes there. Well, I don't know how you found us this morning. I don't know your religious experience. I wanted to welcome you. Uh, whether you consider yourself a Christian, whether it's been your, your first time logging on, uh, maybe you're at home and you're eavesdropping what your spouse is, is listening to, that's cool. But we believe in God. And because of this, we believe in a source of peace. We believe in a leader who, who makes executive decisions that never go wrong. We believe in progress so certain that he moves heaven and earth to keep his word. We believe in a leader so flawless that he has this title. He is called the Prince of Peace. And his name is Jesus. 
And maybe more than anything else, more than anything else right now, Jesus is calling you and calling us all to see again that he brings the peace we truly need. That sports could never satisfy and our job and career could never satisfy and our kids and all the good things of this world could never satisfy because nothing else but Jesus can give us otherworldly peace. And that's what I'd like to discuss with you. A source of peace that is so far more reliable than anything else the world has to offer right now. So we're going to get into the Bible, and I'm not sure your experience with this book. I spent eight years of my life studying this book, learning the Greek and the Hebrew. And and I want to catch you up if if you're new to it. It's a compilation of a lot of people writing. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all eyewitnesses walking with Jesus, and they just recorded what it was like to walk with Jesus. Uh, They recorded that. Um, There are many manuscripts of the New Testament available, and I've done the academic research that says, wow, this is a reliable word that that surely has been preserved through the ages. In in fact, less than 1% of the New Testament shows any discrepancies about it. And and more than that, I attach faith to this book. I, I believe God has promised to speak through it. And so that's what I use as a teaching tool. Our our true source of life and peace is the word that God has spoken to us. Um, So that's our background. This is living and active. And today we're going to turn to uh, John chapter 14. I want to give you a little bit of background, um, uh, the context, set the story. Um, What had just happened is they were in the upper room. They had just celebrated the Passover festival. And Judas had already left to betray the Lord. And while he's about to give his life, um, see, it will just be hours before Good Friday where he's nailed to a cross and he dies. While, while he's about to leave them, he, he's trying to tell his disciples why they can have peace. He, he's trying to convince them of all the reasons that in, in the midst of the, this dire circumstance, and, and they're going to be disturbed. They're going to be more disturbed than probably we are during COVID-19, watching Jesus the Messiah die. He's telling him, and he's telling us, why there's always otherworldly peace with him. Now, we can't cover the whole chapter in this brief time we have together, but John 14, if you want a devotion this week, just go over that whole section. It's so wonderful. We're going to pick some passages out, um, invite you to follow along in your Bibles um, or on the screen here for what God says. John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. I need to pause there right away. The Greek uh, for this has this idea of like something that's being stirred up and agitated. It reminds me of shaking up a Coke bottle, right, and releasing it. And and so our our hearts, they feel that way maybe right now. They feel all shaken up and about to explode. And God comes in and he says, in the most loving way possible, stop it. Don't let your hearts be agitated. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Why? You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Well, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Disciples then and now still get confused. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus and the Father are one along with the Holy Spirit. We see the Trinity here. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Will remind you of everything I have said to you. If you're at home, say this with me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be stirred. And don't be afraid. Aren't these wonderful words? The words that we get to dig into in our time together. If you're at home, could you turn to your family member or just say out loud, I am not afraid. I am not afraid. 
All right, let's talk about reasons why we're not. Out of all the places you could be during COVID-19, what is the safest place to be? I was doing some research over the countries that are handling it well, and I heard that Vietnam, they had 12 cases of the coronavirus, and all who had the coronavirus are now cured. I heard most recently they had maybe 80 cases of the coronavirus. And so out of all the places to be, maybe you'd like to be in Vietnam. When it comes to what our leaders are telling us, and maybe you've seen the statistics and how this works, uh, the safest place that medical people are telling us is to be at home, uh, where you are. And that means there's a lot of home activities going on in the safest place. In in fact, right now might be a good time to do a house project. Uh, You could probably figure out every corner of your house and what it all needs and and how to build your, your cave. This past week, um, my wife rented a uh, carpet cleaner w- when we could still go out, and, uh, and, and we cleaned the carpets because we're at home. So maybe home is the safest place to be, at least for a time. But what if? Let's do hypotheticals. What if I could invite you to a place, and I could promise you that there would be no more COVID-19 there? What if I could invite you to a place where it's filled with people, and get this, all of those people you like and all of those people you get along with. What if I could invite you to a place that shames our mountains and oceans in its splendor, in its glory, in its beauty? Now, some of you might have been tracking with me if you're in the Christian faith. Do you know this place exists? It's the place that Jesus talked about. What did Jesus tell his disciples uh, then and us? Look what he said. In my father's house are many mansions. Do you know you, you get a mansion and I get a mansion. It's like this big HGTV giveaway. Awesome. And who's working on it? Jesus. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now I know it's something to have Chip and Joanna work on your home. Um, I'd rather have Jesus. <laughs> Some of you might read uh, this book and and know that this earth, all it took was six days. And boy, is it beautiful. That new heavens and new earth, how long has he been preparing it? For 2,000 years. And maybe that's why scripture says, so no eye has seen, no mind has conceived the wonder of what's in store. Why can you have otherworldly peace? Here's the first takeaway. Because you are promised an otherworldly place. Now, how does it compare with this place? You know, it's interesting that during this time of COVID-19, we are experiencing many disappointments. Uh, This past week, I had a conversation with a brother pastor who is getting married on Saturday. And uh, he had all these plans grandparents and friends, uh, people from all across the country who were going to gather and celebrate just that great occasion uh, now boil down to 10. And there was some real disappointment there. Th- there's disappointment for kids who are maybe approaching a graduation and wondering what's in store for that celebration. Maybe missing some friends or will miss some friends in the time to come. That there's disappointment for church people. Right now should be like the high point of the church worship season where we gather together and celebrate Jesus as he goes to the way to the cross for us, out of love for us, and then rises again on Easter. And again, I I can't promise when we're going to meet in person again and, and when that will happen. There are those who have planned financial futures and vacations and birthday parties, and spring break adventures. And because of this, there is disappointment going on around all of us. But before COVID-19, was there disappointment? Yeah, there was. In fact, it, it reminds us the state of this world. That yes, God made it perfectly, but it didn't stay perfect. That sin wrecked this world to the degree that Jesus had to warn us about this world and our expectations In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. 
I've overcome this world. In fact, Scripture would remind us that as long as we're here on earth, do you know you're just a camper? Have you ever been camping? And camping can feel very impermanent. I remember camping in Texas, and it was in a tent, and and I heard like armadillos outside, and the wind, and everything was very scary to me. And so I went into the conversion van because I didn't like the camping experience. And so God is is saying, yeah, I I know you're you're feeling all the waves and all the shaking and everything, but but that's because you're, you're camping. No matter how nice you make your home right now, if you've just cleaned the carpets or painted the walls, it's just a tent. I'm going to tear it down. And we're going to take you home. To that new place. With such splendor that Scripture describes it with streets of gold, not literal but figurative, to try to give us imagination that it's glorious. Uh, pearly gates are gems um, to, to a new heavens and a new earth where you'll have real bodies and be with real people who love you and then be enveloped with the love of God. Why can you have peace? Because you have an otherworldly place. But, but some of you may ask, well, how can I be sure that I'm going there? How can I be sure that this is the place that I'm going to get to? Well, Jesus reminded us how to get there. Uh, Jesus said very clearly, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus says he is the only way to get to that place. He is that way, and through him alone. But, but I think we need to talk about how this is contrary to, to, to how we are built. And to do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about what feels natural versus what is actually good. Do you know, something that happens during COVID-19, what feels very natural right now is to hoard things. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? And I confess I've been to the grocery store a, a couple more times than usual. Um, I bought a couple extra boneless, skinless chicken breast. Um, and, and everyone knows about the great toilet paper panic, right? Um, I was doing some research and uh, found that there has been an armed robbery for toilet paper. Um, I was doing some research and found this isn't the only time that there was toilet paper panic. Back in the 70s, I guess Johnny Carson had made a bad joke about running out of toilet paper, and so they actually did for about a month. And I was doing some research on, on why it is we're tempted to hoard. And I found a reason that I, that I believe in. Uh, Business Insider said this, that hoarding makes people feel secure. And this is especially relevant when the world is faced with a novel disease over which all of us have little or no control. So, so why might you be hoarding things? It's, it's a way of saying, I have at least control over this, over my bathroom, thank you very much. But what we're finding is that what is natural is not actually what is right. Correct? Maybe you've heard, you know, even though if, like me, you, you were tempted to buy a little too much, uh, uh, you know, our, our leaders would say, don't do that. <laughs> it's going to be fine. We have enough, right? Yet it reminds me that what feels natural is not always right. In fact, there's a proverb that says this, there is a way that appears to be right. It appears like I should hoard, but in the end, it's not right. It leads to death. And this reminds me of how we're all spiritually built. You know, when it comes to getting to heaven, there's a way that appears right. And it's by being a really good person. You know, if I'm a really good neighbor and I share my toilet paper, if I'm a really good neighbor and I help the elderly and I call them, if I'm a really good person, as long as my good outweighs my bad, then then I'll get to heaven. And while that might feel natural, God actually says that, that that'll lead to death. Because to get to heaven, it's not just about being good, it's about being perfect. Now let me ask you, are you perfect? I can't claim to be. I don't even think Mother Teresa or Mahatma Gandhi would claim to have gotten it all right in thought, word, and deed. And and the scripture relates to us that, that we do sin in thought, word, and deed, and that this actually deserves not heaven, but hell. The wages of sin is death. And so what appears like the right thing to make sure I'm really, really good and improving myself is actually the wrong way. But this is what makes Jesus so beautiful. If perfection is what is required, perfection is what Jesus is. 
tempted in every way and yet found without sin. Hallelujah. Jesus, who goes to the cross during this time to bear the thorns and bear the nails and to spread out his arms and say, it is finished. Why? Because the way was finished. And the way was now open for sinners to have a perfect relationship with the Holy God and sinners to go home to a perfect God all through faith in the one who is the way. How beautiful is Jesus the way. And so we can have otherworldly peace because there is an otherworldly way. You don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is be forgiven. And so if you're just tuning in right now and you didn't know much about the Christian faith and you just thought it was for all the good people, <laughs> it's about all the forgiven people who found hope and peace in Jesus that they desperately needed to cover all their sin. And if you can relate to that, you are among us. Welcome to the family. But if Jesus was an otherworldly way, what if during this time we could have an otherworldly way about us? What if instead of the natural, just take care of myself, I now took care of others? You know, there are some inspiring stories coming out of what people are doing. I heard this past week of a college kid who gathered other young people, and they were going to go to the grocery stores and, and get what was needed for the elderly and, and deliver them and, and, and social distance and say hello, um, but, but watch out for those who, who really needed it. I've heard of those who've had masks and ventilators donate these to the hospital and the medical staff who really needed it. I've seen the companies, you know, revisit what they're, they're doing to, to, to supply what we really need. How wonderful. And, and I think, what could God be doing spiritually to give us a way that wasn't going on before? To give us a way that extends beyond COVID-19. One of my favorite posts on social media uh, going around is this. It, it has two different reactions to COVID-19. That, that Satan says, you know what I'll do? I will cause anxiety, fear, and panic. I will shut down business schools, uh, places of worship, sports events. I will cause economic turmoil. And what does Jesus say? I'll bring together neighbors, restore the family unit. I'll bring dinner back to the kitchen table. I will help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world. I will teach my children to trust me, not their money and material resources. God knows how to be good in spite of all that's going on. You know, before COVID-19, you were a good Christian if you worshipped one hour a week, if you came regularly to church for one hour What's really interesting is, and I challenge you for this, I double dog dare you, I don't think it would be much to ramp up our one hour a week to seven hours a week, or even ten, to gather with the family and, and enjoy all of the online Christian content, to, to today maybe get one service in and then another service in, it wouldn't take too much for us to prioritize worship like never before. Or with our time at home, instead of binging that next season of Netflix to binge the next book of the Bible and say, well, I've been in that one, now I need some time for that one. And, and by the way, you could probably do them both, there's time. To when we're feeling isolated and not able to talk to that friend or see that coworker or be by that person, to say, I know who's with me. And have the greatest conversation, which we call prayer where we talk to our God who loves us the most, knows us the most, and can do something about it. What if God is changing our way? Another thought for peace. You know, I, I was wondering, if, if Jesus were right here with me, hey Jesus, <clears throat> would I be afraid of COVID-19? I think of the disciples Let's go back to the New Testament. Let's say you're one of the disciples and you were walking with Jesus and someone came up and they had COVID-19. Would you be terrified after seeing what Jesus had already done? If you were with Jesus, you had already seen him take mud and open the eyes of the blind. If you were with Jesus, you saw when friends lowered a cripple from a roof and, and he just said, get up, take your mat and go, and the, and the guy just walked away. If you were a Jesus, you, you'd see him approach 10 with leprosy, and that was a disease. Boy, was it life-threatening, and boy, was it contagious. And he healed all 10 by giving them the word. 
And the best, a man named Lazarus was dead and just says, come out. And a dead man was raised to life. If Jesus were right here, would you be afraid of COVID-19? I don't think you'd have reason where you'd need to be. But Jesus isn't here physically in his earthly ministry, even though he's always with us. And Jesus actually said, when I end my earthly ministry and I go to heaven, it's actually going to be better for you. Do you know that? <laughs> so, so Jesus is reminding us that like you have it better than those who walked with Jesus. You know why? It'll be better for you because when I go, I'm going to send someone and watch out for this one. I'm going to send someone who's able to make people speak in tongues they never trained or prepared for. I'm going to send someone who's going to make sure people know the gospel of a risen Savior. I'm going to send someone. and His name is the Holy Spirit. Now look at what uh, Jesus said. He said, The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. And so we, the New Testament church, have the Holy Spirit. And Jesus even says, It's better that I go so that you can have him. And so why can we have otherworldly peace? Because we have right now an otherworldly power. You see, it is the Spirit that gives us eyes to see how beautiful Jesus is. The Spirit gives us hearts to hold Jesus, because no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who gives us hands and feet to live out the godly directives. And the Spirit who guards our minds with the peace of God as he reminds us of all the promises God has for us of how good God is even now. You know, one of my favorite passages about the Spirit comes from 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says this, The Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Gives us power, love, and self-discipline. If you're at home, repeat after me, will you? Say this, say, I have power, I have peace, I am not afraid, because I have the Spirit of God. I have power. I have peace. I am not afraid because I have the Spirit of God. And how might the world change? What's God up to? I don't have all the answers. But how could the world change for good? And maybe there's a double entente. Maybe it'll never be the same, and maybe it'll never be the same in a good way. Here, here's what I know about COVID-19, that at one point or another, it has to end. In fact, one of the posts I saw was from the Frankfurt Chamber that said this, said, I know this, that when this ends, and it will, every game will sell out, every restaurant will have a two-hour wait, every kid will be glad to be in school. I wonder about that one. Everyone will love their job, the stock market will skyrocket, every other house will get TP'd. <laughs> We'll all embrace and shake hands, and that's going to be a pretty good day. Hang in there. And we who know Scripture know that there are seasons, and seasons come and they go, and this is going to be a season just like anything else, and God's going to remain with us. But what if one of the changes is how the Spirit of God was unleashed on us, the church? What if out of all the things COVID-19 did, what if it woke up the sleeping giant that we call the Christian church? And what if everyone who believes that Jesus is their Lord and Savior re-identifies that he needs to be number one, that worship comes first, that everything else is like chasing after a rainbow with no pot of gold? What if he's using that to do it right now, to change hearts and lives and hopefully eternities for good? May that be. May it start with us to unleash the Holy Spirit in my own life as I hear the word and to have otherworldly peace in spite of all that is going on. May it be for you as well. Let me pray for us. So Lord, we pray that you would send your spirit as you promised to increase in us and our country and across the world, the knowledge of the faith in your Son, Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
Thank you for preparing a place for us. Thank you for keeping that plan and letting nothing come in the way of us being with you. Grant peace to troubled hearts. Let comfort and rest and perspective wash over us. We pray according to your will, a quick end to COVID-19, but ultimately that you would have your way and that your kingdom would come. Amen.